The digital landscape's changing so frequently, so the percentage of businesses that aren't seeing the arbitrage that they once had on digital platforms is super pronounced now in 2023. If you're not focused on a framework that is scaling leading indicators and then iterating over time and over time and over time and scaling those things from a small idea and a small budget to then a larger and larger budget, by the time you're ready for MMM, your culture, your marketing culture is just not in a place where it's going to be able to absorb that information, make the right decisions, and then actually take action on that information. And taking action is the whole game. Like you underscored the right point, which is like, if you're just using it for like insights to pat yourself on the back, like don't do that. That's not, it's not a good use of time. It's not a good use of resources. I'm really excited to chat with with Michael today. Michael is kind of, I don't really know you personally, Michael, but from what I've heard from Lucas and seen on the internet, you're kind of a, a data god, and um, you know it's we're really, a little bit. It's the data god. Un, it's an undersell. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm trying to humble you a little bit. <laughs> um, but no, like we're we're really interested in in data and and what and how data can tell a story to creative people, marketing people to to make better customer journeys at the end of the day. And um, you know, media mix modeling is something that our team has really been diving deeper and deeper into over the past twelve months. And so, like, I'm really excited to kind of chat through that with you. That seems like something that you're going, you've been deep on, and are going like to the the abyss on. It truly is an abyss, honestly. So yes, that's right, and I can shout out what I've learned from from the depths of the abyss back to y'all. Let's just dive right into the abyss. But for the sake of the layman, which is going to be me in this conversation, I know a bit about MMM, but if you could just sort of describe, if you were at a dinner party and you had to describe what you do and what medium mixed modeling is, like, what is it? How would you describe it? And then also, how has it changed in your opinion over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years? And like, how would you describe modern MMM today? Awesome question. Yeah. So I think at the highest level, right, the idea behind MMM is we want to use statistics and machine learning or AI, if you're pitching a VC, uh, to find the relationship between marketing activity on one side and a business KPIs, new customers acquired or revenue on the other side. The idea, the reason why this is sort of powerful and you know sometimes shocking for a lot of modern performance marketers is that you wanna do that without digital tracking, right? Without trying to track people across the internet. That in one sense, like makes the game a lot harder, right? Cause you have a lot less data to work with. But on the positive side, it gives you insight that you can't get just from digital tracking because it allows you to measure channels that are offline like TV or radio. And it allows you to compare channels on an apples to apples basis in a way that isn't possible when you're just trying to track clicks or impressions. And so the core idea is we're gonna look at aggregate first party data, and then we're gonna use statistics, econometrics, or machine learning to find the relationships in the data that then tell us how effective is that marketing activity. So your journey to MMM, from my understanding, started at Harry's. Can you just describe kind of your evolution understanding, wow, this is where the market's moving and this is really an important part of our data analytics infrastructure as a growing brand that was once D2C native and then kind of expanded into other channels and things started to become more complex. Yeah, absolutely. So Harry's went on this like really exciting journey while I was there of starting out D2C only. They were one of the first really big D2C focused brands and then evolved into, you know, omni-channel CPG brands selling multiple products online, on Amazon, in-store at Target, in-store at Walmart. Now you can buy them everywhere that razors are sold. And that evolution meant sort of going on an evolution of different types of marketing measurement technology. So I ran the data science team. Our team built our internal multi-touch attribution tool. And we worked really closely with the marketing team on that. We did churn prediction. We did LTV forecasting. All of those sorts of tools we built internally. And MMM came up when, you know, I was talking to, this, to the, the CEO one day and we were talking about how do we optimize marketing for the holistic business now that we're selling in Target and now that we're selling in Walmart, doing all of our marketing optimization based on what drives people to www.harrys.com doesn't seem like the right decision anymore. We actually want to take this broader view and the multi-touch attribution tool that we had was never going to be able to address that question because we have no insight into how the dollars that we're spending on YouTube are driving people to, to pick up razors in store at Target. And so this idea of MMM came up. We were like, well, what do the other brands do? And they do MMM. And so I went and I investigated all of those different tools 
and was like, mm, I don't know, like they're not going to work for Harry's because they've, you know, Coke and Pepsi have been doing that for 50 years, but they do it in a very different way than the way that the performance marketing team at Harry's works, where we're in the weeds on Facebook every day, adjusting the levers, trying to, you know, get ever more juice out of that platform and like getting, running a report once every six months and being like digital is good is like not helpful for anyone. So like that wasn't going to work. And so that was where I started like really going into the weeds. I'm like, okay, how can we make this work? What are the actual tools that people need? How can we bring this technology into the modern world? That is fascinating, by the way, Michael. That is fascinating. I, I know Lucas has a series of questions on this. I just want to ask you, when did Harry's bring you in? Was it post Target and retail launch? And they were like, whoa, we got to figure this out. Or was it pre-launch and they, they knew they knew that they needed it? Harry's brought me in pre-target launch. So I was there, you know, I started the analytics and data science team effectively as one person. I was the team prior to launching in Target when they were, you know, a growing D2C brand, but before actually moving into physical retail. You can just see the application and like where MMM becomes relevant. Like obviously the landscape, the digital landscape is changing so frequently. So the percentage of businesses that aren't seeing the arbitrage that they once had on digital platforms is super pronounced now in 2023. So it's forcing them to expand into, you know, omni-channel business models where they're on Amazon, they're on a variety of different sales channels where MMM actually becomes super valuable. And then vice versa, the retail businesses that have digitized, they need to assess the effect of this in their marketing spend. I also want to talk, I want to come back to that because that's really related to how businesses view their PL and how they're actually bifurcating ad spend. Um, this is a huge problem right now with traditional direct consumer marketers because they're, they're actually not optimizing their financial statements to actually, like their, their financial PLs to actually drive growth across all channels of the business. They have like pockets of spend in different places. Well, maybe talk more about that. Like what, what is the, what's the P&L issue that you see here or the mistake that people are making? They're treating the business as, as, as they're treating basically different sales channels as like independent, separate business units. Totally. And yeah. huge problem. for, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a huge issue because 70% of like gross advertising, advertising is digital, but 15% of or 15 to 20%, I don't know exactly what it is, of all retail sales are direct to consumer. And too many brands, they're just looking at their digital spend as a line item on the direct to consumer PL. So it actually doesn't even let you unlock the potential of digital for your retail channels or just to look at it from a holistic perspective. So maybe talk a little bit how MMM actually is a, is a great solve for that. Yeah, totally. So I fully agree that this is a big problem. I think a lot of brands are way too myopic in how they're thinking about managing their whole business. I think that that will evolve like a lot. I think a lot of that comes from these companies that grew up D to C. And so like, that's the way that they know how it works. And they're sort of stuck in that box. They're going to have to come out of the box if they're going to be successful because of competitive pressures. But like totally a problem that I see across lots of businesses today. MMM, again, a lot of brands go on this journey that I went through at Harry's of realizing this is a problem. Like, oh man, if we can actually make a case that the dollars that we're spending on YouTube not only drive D2C and maybe don't even have a great return on D2C, but also drive stores in these other or sales in these other channels then we can unlock a bunch more spend, unlock a bunch more growth for the whole business. And then all of a sudden we're at, like it's a step change for the business. And so MMM is very much designed to answer that question. When we spend on digital, how much does that drive in store? What's the all in return on investment, not just the direct to consumer return on investment on these dollars that we're spending across all of the different channels. And again, if you're myopically only focused on the D to C ROI, you're going to underspend what you could for what would maximize growth for the whole business. Yeah. And you're just, I mean, ultimately pigeonholing yourself. I see a lot of marketers today, they're getting, they're getting way too, I would say, focused on like granular attribution, like probabilistic attribution that is, is very hazy, you know, from a broad stroke perspective, instead of looking at the big picture of the business. Part of that is like how company org charts are set up, PL issue we talked about, and then also just how people have been trained over the last decade. Talk to me about how you think about attribution and is you know it an important part um, of what a marketer should be thinking about if you're building a data science team? You know what are your priorities? So attribution, just to like def define the term for the purpose of this conversation for the listeners, like when we when I talk about attribution, I mean digital tracking. Like we are going to track this user, what ads did they view or click on prior to conversion, and then assign some amount of credit to that. 
So in that case, like I think attribution has an important role to play for the DTC parts of a business and probably will forever. But um, there are a lot of limitations that come with it. And so you just need to be really aware of what those limitations are and then think about, you know, what is the right tool for the business at the stage that we're at? So if you are bootstrapping a D to C e-commerce business, whether it's sort of a drop shipping style or whatever it is that you're doing, you're going to get started with attribution. Um, and that's the right thing to do, right? Because you're going to focus on probably one, maybe two marketing channels at most. You're going to want to drive as much efficiency in those as you can. They're going to be probably Meta and Google, a lot of great tools. You don't have to worry that much about incrementality because you're only on two channels and like that reporting is going to do really well for you. I think if you're in that situation, you look at a first touch attribution report, you look at a last touch attribution report, that's going to get you 85% of the way there of everything that you could possibly want to know. And you're going to be able to scale that business up to a certain point. The problem then is going to come once you start expanding beyond those couple of channels and you start experimenting with uh, advertising that is less at the very bottom of the funnel. Right. Once you start doing influencers or YouTube videos or things where you don't necessarily expect people to like click and buy right then, that's where you start to run into this problem of like you actually need to think about incrementality. And incrementality is this idea of like causal relationships. If I spend an extra thousand dollars in this channel, how much is that truly going to drive our revenue? Or if I take a thousand dollars out, how much revenue are we going to lose? That's the thing that you really care about as a marketer. And attribution, unfortunately, is very close to incrementality when you're only on a few channels and you're very small and it gets farther away as the business gets bigger. And so this is this problem that we see across the industry right now where marketers get trained on attribution, thinking it's the same thing as incrementality when their business is small, business gets bigger, more complex. It actually is less indicative of incrementality, but they're still like using those same methods and they're misleading themselves and misleading the business by relying on that measurement methodology. Michael, I want to ask a two, a two parter, a two parter. Okay. So I love to think about businesses, business lifespans and the stages within those lifespans. I like to just compartmentalize things and just say, okay, you know, these set of businesses have these set of characteristics. They're kind of in this stage of their lifespan versus another one, other, other cohorts of businesses. And you can sort of start to see like, all right, a younger set of businesses needs to do X, Y, and Z to jump into that next stage of their lifespan. So you just kind of mentioned like, as you start layering on influencer or YouTube videos or things that are a bit more top of funnel, a bit more brand awareness focused, when would you advise generally? I know it's really like, it depends is always the answer, but when, would you generally advise a brand to really start investing and in thinking about incrementality and an MMN to to kind of help solve for that? Like what type of types of characteristics, whether revenue stage, whether you know what what their media mix looks like, things like that. That's my that's one part of my question. Okay. And the other part is then how do you how does it actually work? Right. So let's say you have a brand, I, I don't know how you're gonna define it. And I'm really curious as, as to how you define when to start investing in this, but what is the difference between how it actually works, how media mix modeling works for a brand that is more if infantile, that is just starting to get into that type of analyzation to a brand that is much farther along in their lifespan that is much larger and more complex? Okay. This is a great question. I'll sort of talk through how I, how I, how I think about this. And this is honestly like, I give this recommendation to people a lot when I get on sales calls and, you know, I often am trying to figure out like what stage are you at and what should you be doing? Yeah. And a lot of times MMM is not a thing that they should be thinking about. And I will tell okay. people that. So I'll walk through at least how I assess that from my perspective. So to start, brands should always be thinking about incrementality, right? That is the thing that actually matters because that's what determines the true return on investment of additional dollars invested into marketing. So even if you're not like explicitly measuring incrementality, it should be a thing that's on your mind from day zero of starting to spend on marketing. How, what am I getting for this marketing? And that answer cannot always, cannot generally be answered just by looking at one report out of some platform. So always be thinking about incrementality, be thinking about how the reporting can mislead you about incrementality and be focused on what is the incrementality of every dollar that I'm investing because that's how you get to maximizing profit. So what brands generally start with doing is some amount of digital tracking, right? Assuming that there's some digitally native brand, that's great. Start with that. 
Hopefully you find one channel that works. You're blowing the wheels off. You don't need to think that hard about incrementality because it's like, look, clearly when we're investing these additional dollars, we're clearly getting a bunch of additional return. I don't need to spend that much time thinking about it. That's a great stage to be in. That's what you need to be focused on at the beginning days of a brand is finding one channel that blows the doors off of it. So you don't really need to think that hard about the true incrementality. You need to think about scaling and dealing with all of the problems that that brings. Next stage is you're starting to explore these other different marketing channels, right? You're layering on your second, your third, your fourth channel. There, what I generally recommend is don't think about MMM because MMM is hard. It's hard to get right. It's easy to be misled. Think about building an experimentation muscle, right? And that can take a bunch of different forms. It can be like, look, let's just be smart about our launch into this channel. Let's have a clear before and after period. Let's not do three things at once. So that way we can get a read. We spent, you know, 10,000 bucks on this channel in this month. Did we see a lift in revenue? You can do that analysis in Excel. It will be directional. It won't be perfect, but it gives you that good sense to know, like, was this a flat line and did nothing or did it at least do something? And can we start to trust these numbers that we're getting from the reporting sources? Building the muscle of being able to run a geographic holdout test is another really good thing to be able to do. It's very simple to understand. They're not that hard to execute. A lot of the platforms have the ability to run incrementality tests these days. Meta has it. Some of the other ones do as well. Doing that occasionally and starting to get a sense for, okay, how is the results of these tests and experiments that have a really good sort of causal theory behind them to get to incrementality? How is that different from the reports I'm getting from other sources? Starting to think about that and having those conversations internally, that's really step two. And so that's what I recommend to a lot of people that are in that stage of probably like, you know, more than $500,000 uh, a year in annual annual marketing spend, but le like less than $5 million a year, like that range is where it's like, you should start be doing some experiments, start trying to learn from them, start thinking and talking about incrementality. And then once you're beyond that, like $5 million plus dollars a year in marketing spend, you're generally at that point on more than five marketing channels, some of which are you know, offline or like connected TV, where it's like definitely the distance between a click and a conversion is going to be further and further away. Maybe you're expanding into retail, maybe you're expanding into Amazon at that point. That's where you want to start thinking about like, okay, let's get more sophisticated. Let's investigate MMM. Problem with MMM is that it's just, it's hard to do. It's hard to get right. It's the actual, the biggest problem with MMM is that it's easy to do it wrong. And so it's easy to mislead yourself. And that's the really big problem is if you're not a statistician and you're not really good at it and knowing like where the sharp edges are, it's very hard to do right. And like, that's what we're building at Recast, but like Recast is an expensive enterprise tool, right? And like, we've sanded off those sharp edges, but it takes a ton of work and it's taken years of PhD research time to get that right. It's very easy to do it wrong. It's very easy to like plug some numbers into Excel spreadsheet, get some numbers out on the other side. And like, those aren't right at all. And it misleads you. And so I would say until you're at the point where you have enough marketing spend, where it's really worth investing a lot of time and money into getting it right, where there's payoff there of like, yes, if we make our marketing spend 5% more efficient, it's going to be worth it. Then I would say like, don't really worry about it too much. We're going to come back to the the question, the, the second part that I asked. I want to get there, but you just brought up something really interesting. I would ask and frame the question, a question to something that you just said in this way. What are some of the, like the, the simple mistakes that brand spending, you know, five to 10 million in marketing a year make when they try to enter into MMM and you know, maybe what are some of the things that brands do need to do right? You know, just in, in simple terms. Yeah. So I think. Mistakes that they make are only like dipping a toe in, right? If you're going to do an MMM project, you sort of need to go whole hog. You need to educate the business about, look, this is how it works. This is what the assumptions are. This is how we're going to interpret this data and use it. If you just want to be like, oh man, I'm going to hire an analyst intern and they're going to spend four weeks on it. Like that's just a waste of time. That's not going to be useful for anybody. Nobody's going to trust the results. No one's going to take action off of them. No one's going to like validate it. So that's like not, it's just not good. No one's going to take action on it. No one is going to take action on it. That is, I just want to highlight that. And that just goes back. I just want to like underscore this because this is something we talk about with our clients all the, all the time, which is you talked about an experimentation muscle and, you know, we, we call that a framework and just a way of working and collaborating with your team, which is going to be five to 10, sometimes 15 people on a marketing team that have to coordinate and collaborate on all these different things. If you're not focused on a framework that is 
scaling leading indicators and then iterating over time and over time and over time and scaling those things from a small idea and a small budget to then a larger and larger budget. If you're just sort of like allocating capital in sort of random ways across different channels, like by the time you're ready for MMM, to your point, your team is just not, your culture, your marketing culture is just not in a place where it's going to be able to absorb that information, make the right decisions, and then actually take action on that information, which is like, you're screwed. And taking action is the whole game. Like you underscored the right point, which is like, if you're just using it for like insights to pat yourself on the back, like don't do that. That's not, it's not a good use of time. It's not a good use of resources. MMM even like, I think traditionally makes that education with a potential client so much more difficult because of the time that it takes actually to derive insights. And I know Recast, we've talked to Mike about Recast. The platform is is exceptional. I think it's making serious innovations in that space, which you should talk about. But I mean, we use MMM internally on some of the more open source models, not as innovative. And it's like a, it's like such a process to get a client who traditionally went from like a pure attribution. Yeah, it's just been a, an absolute battle to get people to actually look at the MMM and take action on it because it's it's being delivered maybe like after a month or, you know, Recast is delivering in a week, which is great. But there's still time. You need to get someone to really understand it so they can actually like optimize budgets according to what the, the model is saying and that it's accurate. This, I mean, this has been super interesting to see organizations go through this journey. Like what we've seen is that you can't force feed this to an organization. Like if I talk to someone on a sales call and they're like, yeah, I'm interested in this, but like, I don't know, the CEO, you know, mostly reporting is fine. We're like, you're not ready. The only time, so we talked to like two different types of organizations. One is we have MMM, it goes to the board, they get what it does. We just don't like the vendor. It's too slow. It doesn't give us the detailed insights. That's like great slam dunk. Other one is like, hey, we've never used MMM before. We're not sure how to use it. And that's actually like scarier and much harder because you have to go through this education journey with not just the marketing team, but the whole organization. How do we think about this? How do we re-educate everyone about what is incrementality? How do we think about it? How are we going to manage the business in a very different way than what we had been doing historically? And like, you shouldn't underestimate how long and complex of a journey that is to get people who are not used to thinking about the world in a probabilistic way, in a non-deterministic tracking way, and get them to start thinking about incrementality and other types of measurement that you know I believe are right for that business long term, but can feel very scary to people who aren't used to thinking that way and haven't been trained that way. Yeah, that's well said. So I kind of cut you off. I've cut you off twice now. When you were mid, I can't. I don't even remember the context from back then. So you're gonna have to refresh me on it. Yeah, no, but I think it's it's helpful now. Like, I'd love to just get into how it works, right? Because, and just to reframe this again a little bit, we talk to brands who are doing nine figures selling in Ulta, Sephora, Target, and D 2 C. We talk to brands that are just trying to launch on Amazon, you know, and everyone in between. And so, if you were to, you know, imagine you're on a sales pitch you know, talking to a brand that's in the latter category, they're a bit more immature versus a brand that is much more mature, maybe a legacy brand that is now trying to re-engineer how they make decisions. What are the differences in the way you talk about how MMM actually works? Like if I wanted to just peek under the hood and be like, Mike, how does this work, dude? How would you explain that? This is a really good question. And honestly, like I'm going to give you what I often use, but I'm not sure this is the best explanation. So y'all can give me feedback on it. Okay. So one way that I talk about it is I say like, look, let's imagine the easiest case, right? The, and this is an, an analysis that you could do in Excel. So you're spending money like normal. Uh, and then one month you decide you're going to invest a bunch of money in a television campaign. So in March, you know, you were going to keep spending all of our other channels normal. In March, we're going to spend a bunch of money on TV. And then at the end of March, the TV campaign is going to come down. How would we analyze the impact of TV? Well, we would plug our sales numbers into uh, an Excel file and we would look at the start of March and the end of March and we'd say like, okay, did we see sales go up around that time? And then did we see them come back down at some point after March? And that's going to tell us a little bit about what was the impact of that TV spend. You can imagine doing that report in Excel and then like putting it on a PowerPoint deck and presenting it to the board. It's pretty easy to understand. 
Yeah. And so it's like, okay, let's imagine that we did that in March and then we did some radio in April. And so it's like, okay, now it's a little bit more complicated, but you can still imagine doing that in Excel. And then you're like, okay, well, now we get to the real world where it's like, actually, we have a bunch of different marketing channels, but they are all actually moving around some. On some days, we spend relatively a little bit more on TV. And on some days, we launch in radio and then come down. And then on some days, we spend, you know, we accidentally leave Facebook uncapped and it spends a bunch of money and then we pull it back down. And so what you can do is you can imagine like using machine learning to look back at at those patterns on a much more fine grained basis than what you would do with in Excel in the March TV campaign, but still find those relationships and still do that analysis. On days when you spend relatively a little bit more on Facebook, do we get relatively a little bit more revenue on that day and subsequent days? And that's what the MMM is doing under the hood is it's looking for those patterns when you say, okay, controlling for everything else that's going on, when we spend relatively a little bit money, more money in some channel or relatively a little bit less money in some channel, what is the downstream impact of that? And then we can use the statistics and the machine learning to stitch those insights together over time. And that's really what the goal of MMM is. How was that? That was that was pretty good. Um, okay, I feel okay. L- let me know if what the follow up questions are, and we'll see if we can we can get even. Here are the follow up questions. I think the follow up questions are you know for brands that have more complexity, right? Because that's easy to understand. But then it's like, okay, we've got way more going on than testing one thing in one month and then another thing in another month. You know, we've got Sephora pushing a promotion in March. We're doing out of home same month. Sephora is reporting us numbers back in next month. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's complex. So then the question becomes, all right, well, how does this actually work when the cadence is, is what I just described, you know? And, and then the objection is like, is this actually going to help my team? You know, is the cost going to be ROI positive? The cost of recast, the cost of doing this, is that going to be ROI positive? And how do you overcome those objections and answer those types of questions? Yeah, it's a really good question. So the, the first thing, and this is often informative for helping people think about this, is let's imagine the worst case scenario, right? Let's imagine that we have two channels that are perfectly correlated, which is to say that they you know move up and down at the same time. So in this TV example, instead of saying, hey, we're going to go, we're going to have the march of TV, it's actually the march of TV and radio. At the beginning of March, we spend up in both TV and radio, and at the end of March, we spend down on both TV and radio. We are not going to be able to know which, whether it is TV or radio that is having an impact. The model will not be able to differentiate between those two programs. So that is a fundamental limitation of what we're talking about here. To the the extent that there are two totally new things that are happening at the same time, no statistical model will be able to differentiate that. There's no identification strategy there, which is what a statistician would say. And so there are fundamental limitations here. In general, that is not happening where they're perfectly correlated. Right there, if you're doing a Sephora in store thing, yes, that's happening, but maybe the radio thing actually started, you know, a week or two before and then goes a week or two longer. And now there are differences the model can use to start picking up. Okay, well, how much could be due to radio and how much is due to Sephora due to the timing of when the sales happen and when the marketing activity is happening? There will likely be uncertainty there. And depending on the quality of the MMM, the quality of the model, we might, you know, have more or less uncertainty in differentiating between what is what, but that's sort of the best that we can do in that scenario. And so I would say, you know, to someone asking these questions, it's like, yes, there will be uncertainty. However, getting some signal is probably better than no signal. And if we're talking about Sephora sales, like what other option do you have? And so if we can get some signal that can help us make better decisions, even if it's not the perfect decision. And so that's a way to start thinking about, okay, is it this going to be worth it for us or not? I would definitely say that like MMM is not worth it for every brand. And you should absolutely think through like, what is the ROI on these insights that we're actually getting in terms of being able to action off of them. But just because things are happening at once doesn't mean that it's impossible to get a signal. And also I would push people to say like, is it better to get some signal rather than no signal? And then what's the value of that? You know, perfection is impossible. We're never going to get there. But if we can, you know, make better bets in the long run, that should pay off for us as a business. You've mentioned uh, two things that I want to pull out as indicators that a brand should maybe not invest in MMM. One is they don't have the right channel mix or sales channel channel mix yet. They're not as diversified and they just wouldn't benefit from MMM. The second is they're non-believers. Like they, they're either their culture, their team, their org chart is not set up to action on the data that they're going to receive, or they're just like, 
you know, the CEO and the board just doesn't really believe in the data. What are there any other characteristics that you would attribute to brands that are not ready for MMM? I would say those are the two most important. So it's it, a lot of it boils down to just like, what leverage is this tool going to get you? And if you don't have very many marketing channels, like you can't get very much leverage out of it. And then if you can't convince anybody to take action off of it, that's also not going to give you any leverage. I think those are the two biggest. I'm trying to think if there are others. Oh, the other big one is MMM is really hard to do for companies where the time between marketing activity and customers taking an action is very, very long. And so that generally comes up in like B2B contexts. B2B contexts are very hard to do MMM in. Uh, for two reasons. So one is like the sales cycle is very long. And so you spend dollars on advertising and then you don't know if that was successful sometimes until like years later. And then also there's a huge variation in like deal size in, in B2B. Like, you know, I talked to some B2B companies and they're like, yeah, our deals range in size from like $500 a year to uh, 3.4 million that we just signed. And I'm just like, you know, Thinking about how you would plug that into an MMM, it just like it almost doesn't even make sense. Like that's not, I think, a good use case for MMM because the idea MMM can tell you, hey, look, if you spend an extra thousand dollars, we think you can get in number of additional leads, but it doesn't necessarily tell you, like, oh, one of those leads was Walmart and it turned into the biggest deal your company has ever had, and that maybe is actually a more important question for the business. And so that's just like a very different orientation to marketing performance. Okay, you ju that's a perfect segue into what I wanted to ask you next, which is what are some of the things, the needle moving insights that we should be taking away from a media mix model? You know, I'm sure there's tons of stuff that you could glean, but what are the things typically that you see for, let's just say a B2C company that's, you know, their AOV is like $50 or less, you know, it's like a pretty, should be a pretty short sales cycle. Um, what are some of those needle moving things that you typically tell them to target and look at? Yeah. I mean, you know, to some extent, it's the things that you might expect where we help identify some channels that are really underperforming, right? It's like, hey, this channel is difficult to track. The vendor, you know, puts these numbers in front of us. They say it's crushing it, but like, we don't know. And then the MMM results come back. It's like, look, this channel is not actually driving business for you. Like you can cut all of that spend and your business will stay the same. And so like, huge win. The other side is again, the thing that you would expect where channels, where co companies are under investing into certain hard to track channels. We've seen this come up with like Pinterest and YouTube a number of times where there's a lot of reason to believe that those channels for certain products, those channels might be overperforming what their tracking is saying. And so this gives them the ability to like, oh, actually we can double down, triple down, quadruple down into this channel because it's giving us more return than what our last touch attribution model says. And so we see the whole range, but those are the sorts of actions that companies can go take and they'll, you know, triple down into Pinterest, which according to last touch attribution is a dog of a channel, not doing anything for them. But then all of a sudden they have their best month ever the next month. And it's like, oh, that really is doing something meaningful for us that our other models weren't able to pick up. There's a couple of questions that I want to ask you, Mike, and just kind of have a conversation around, uh, because I do think there's a bit of an endemic problem within like the digital marketing community around deploying spend and some of these misleading things that they've learned for so long. One is obviously branded search. So I want to talk about that. And that'll be an interesting talking point. And then the second is like for the multi-location boutique retailer, you know, call it in like fashion or apparel um, that has like 10, 15 stores in the United States. Like what's the best way to calibrate and set up an MMM? And the perspective I'm coming from is that they are literally siloing direct consumer from the other parts of the business yeah. when really they could be deploying spend in a way that is incremental for those retail locations as well as for the direct -to consumer business. Now, I want you to just touch on like how that might be risky, like how you calibrate the MMM to include all of those different facets and how you try and like look at the data in a way that like, can you have a, you know, a perfect situation or do you see cannibalization on direct -to consumer if you try and stretch budget in a way that is also incremental to the retail locations. This is something I'm like actively talking to a lot of prospects about and they're just, they're not, no one knows really how to, what the, what the right answers are. These are really good questions. I mean, I'll preview the second part, like the 10 to 15 boutique locations, that's a really hard problem. So I'm interested in brainstorming with you, but that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, let's talk about brain search. I mean, brain search is a, it's a really easy one to reason about. 
and like it actually like I use this all the time to highlight like why MMM is important because it's a digital channel that is so far at the bottom of the funnel that it is going to show up looking great on any digital tracking measure, but everyone instinctively knows that it's not incremental or it's probably not as incremental for every single click. You'd be surprised on that front too, though. Like, really? I, I got I got off two. I mean, this is this is very interesting though. Like, just some CMOS, and I, I do think the role of the CMO needs to become a little bit more like like a data economist, almost like an an analyst in a way. I had literally two conversations in the past couple of weeks. New CMO coming on board, and they're like, "Yeah, we've reallocated our spend. We allocated more spend towards branded search." And I'm just like, "This, like, come on, uh, increased our marketing efficiency ratio. It's just and MER sometimes is not the the best, you know, the best indicator." No. So yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I mean, you think it's obvious when you're dealing in data all day and talking about this stuff. It's a good but reminder it's still... that I have a myopic view of the world. No, I mean, I think. It is, it's at least easy to like talk through this idea of, look, if they are searching for your brand, they have already heard of you and they are looking interested in engaging with you more. And it's unclear if having that top spot in Google, what that actually adds, like paying Google for that click, how much does that actually add to your business? And I think, you know, it's, it's also hard because like there are times when brand search is incremental. And I've talked about this in a, there are a bunch of ways that if you, you know, if your competitors are actively bidding on your terms and your products aren't that differentiated or you don't have that much brand loyalty, like then you might need to spend money to defend that top spot and it might be worth it for you, but it's going to depend business to business. And, but you're totally right that like coming in and being like, we're going to dump a ton more money to branded search and it's going to like make our last click numbers look great. That's obviously terrible and like not a great forward step for that business. And that's where you want to push people to think about incrementality and testing and like, you know, where, where and when does this make sense for us? But again, it, as you noted, it requires a different skill set from the CMO than I think what a lot of people have been trained on. We need CMOs who can reason about that, who can think about that in order to allocate those dollars efficiently because it's easy to get misled and, you know, buy a bunch of brain search. It's just like, you know, CMOs 10 years ago, like buying impressions and <laughs> being like, I'm going to maximize impressions and then buying a bunch of garbage impressions or buying a bunch of garbage traffic that didn't actually do anything for their business. Because what you actually want to be focused on is incrementality. Who is purchasing? Is Are these dollars actually driving revenue or driving profit? And I mean, that I, that's exactly why, you know, CM, CMO tenure is just getting compressed in such a way. Because channel innovation is accelerating. How many channels can you buy on now? A lot more than what you used to be. It's not as cut and dry. There's a lot of conjecture, you know? So I think a lot of CMOs need to really kind of look at their skill sets and try and, I mean, if you're an aspiring CMO, like you need to really understand um, the data landscape. Let's go back to the boutique question. I know there's like no right answer for it. I've just been like kind of, you know, knocking my head against the wall too of like, how, how do you, because you can slice an MMM in so many different ways. Like you can just look at one location, you can look at all the locations, you can look at the third party commerce locations, yeah. direct to consumer. And yeah, I'm just curious what your take is. Yeah. I mean, this, this is like a really sticky problem because they're not na like their DTC is national. They have some amount of geographic focused boutiques and that makes, it makes the MMM problem much more difficult. Um, and so like, honestly, in this situation, like this is a place where I would focus a little bit more on testing and cause then like the benefit of their situation is that you can really do a lot of like nice geographic level isolation stuff and be like, look, like if we do a Facebook campaign in the surrounding area of these two stores, but not the other 12, do we see a lift and can we get a read on incrementality there? And that is actually where I would focus that business rather than doing MMM, which is going to be really complicated because of the way that they're geographically going to be located or laid out from a statistical perspective. And so I would actually focus that business a little bit more on testing because I think that's where you're going to be able to get much cleaner reads on what's working uh, that you can then generalize ideally to the other, to the rest of the, to the rest of the program. But it is, it's a very, it's a, it's a tough problem because of exactly what you, what you stated, which is you can slice it a bunch of different ways and you have two different marketing programs at two different levels, one geographic focus for the boutiques and then one national focus for the DTC. And so you get, you get into this very sticky statistical problem in terms of trying to use an MMM to analyze that. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's complicated just from a surface level perspective. And, you know, my, my take was that you can't have a perfect model in that situation. No. When I'm curious to hear what you think about, like, obviously the brand performance 
dichotomy is like an interesting thing to dive into. We talk about incrementality or saturation on a given channel. So I am obviously a believer in MMM. I run an MMM company, but I actually think that, you know, MMMs will never tell the fourth story because they do not address creative and tactics and strategy. So like MMM can tell you, you know, in general, what's going on with these different channels, what's going to happen if you only move the spend lever, but the spend lever is not necessarily the most important lever in any marketing channel that we're talking about. Often creative is the most important lever that you have. And then tactics within a channel are incredibly important. And so sometimes people ask us like, oh, you know, why don't you do a benchmarking product? You can just compare our YouTube to everyone else's YouTube. And I'm like, we could, but like, that's not useful really because companies that get really good at YouTube, it takes a lot of work and they get really good at it. The creative on YouTube is so different than anywhere else. The way that you operate that channel tactically is so different. And so if you just take your like Facebook ads and you roll them out on YouTube, that's not going to work for you. It's never going to work. You have to get good at that channel in particular and learn about it and optimize it. And so just saying like, oh, you should spend an extra $10,000 on this channel. Like, yes, that might help you a little bit, but really the low hanging fruit is probably like get really good at that channel if it shows signs of life for you. And you can take a channel that is currently performing at a, you know, a 0.5 X ROI and make it a three X ROI channel by optimizing the creative and optimizing how that channel is run tactically. I like the, I like how you just frame that like creative tactics measurement. It's very similar to, to how we think about, about the, the, the equation. Let's just talk about recast really quickly and some of the innovations that you're making from like a lightweight or a Robin, which are some of the open source frameworks from, you know, the big tech companies. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I can talk a little bit about this. Um, Lightweight and Robin are great sort of starter models, I would say. And like, actually, like if you look back to the first models that my co-founder and I built and wrote, they look very similar to the assumptions that Facebook and Robin make. What we realized over time was that those models have a bunch of like really interesting failure areas um, around, you know, how do things change over time? What happens in the pandemic when some channels got a lot better and some channels got a lot worse for different companies? And so we realized that we needed a much more robust and flexible modeling framework in order to capture all of those interesting wrinkles in reality and how marketing actually works. And so we built a much more powerful modeling framework. It's much more flexible. You know, a lightweight MMM model will have on the order of like dozens of parameters, which is a, you know, statistical term that describes how complex a model is. Recast has tens of thousands. And so we you know, made this investment in making a much more complicated model with the idea being, okay, we can now capture more of reality that will make our model more accurate in more different distinct circumstances. And we're going to invest a ton of time in designing that model and then also designing the compute infrastructure around it that actually makes it work. Like you can't run recasts on a laptop. You would never be able to. We spin up, you know, 40 enormous computers in the cloud every time we want to fit a model. And so we strategically wanted to make basically the most robust model that we possibly could in order to capture as much of reality as we possibly can. And it just turns out that reality is incredibly complex. How does a brand onboard onto Recast? Like, what is that timeline? Like, we're ready. We signed the contract. What is the customer success onboarding look like? How long until I have a model in front of me that's accurate or like, you know, is, is working? functional and and then how much hand holding do you provide to your clients over time like what does that look like at recast we're always trying to like drive that time to value down to as short as possible in general from contract sign to initial results we're looking at about four to six weeks um, which we feel pretty good about we would love to get that down to like two or three weeks um, but for now that process is like look we've got to do initial data integration we've got to do data validation and cleaning where we're like look, you know, hey, we've identified some problem in your data. You seem to be missing data in this channel over this period. Is that real? Is it not? There's that back and forth. Then there's model validation, which takes a couple of weeks. We have it mostly fully automated, but we're running again, you know, thousands of models effectively in the background and then summarizing the results. And there's just a lot of like compute time that goes into that process. Um, so in general, we're looking at like four to six weeks to get to the initial model results and then weekly refreshes after that, which is about as fast as we think is reasonable, given that a lot of the vendors only provide data once a week. So the podcast vendor, the TV vendor are only providing data at that cadence. And so that's the cadence that we're working off of. Okay. Very high touch 
tool that you have very interesting i'm sure it's interesting to build with your team and, and refine over time last thing i want to ask you is and that maybe this could be a little bit of like a manifest um we're always thinking about dream clients that we want to work with and have impact with what are some yeah what are some brands top five top three that you'd love to get on the recast platform uh, i mean like look i want to work with we want to everyone to use recast like that's the dream like i want to get nike on there i want to get coke on our platform i want pepsi i want all of the biggest all of the biggest like iconic marketing brands in the world those are our dream clients i mean we are we're building the platform for the future and we're really excited to work with like the brands that we work with today who push us really hard to you know build a platform that provides a lot of roi and that's really useful for them but the goal is to make it so it's the platform that every brand at every stage can use from you know those smaller brands that are just like ready to dip their toes in all the way up to the biggest brands in the world and so that's that's very much the goal of where we are trying to get well, I wish you all the best. And I think that, uh, a long journey. What, <laughs> so, from, <laughs> we'll see. from what I've seen, you guys are the most sophisticated. So I think, you know, if any, if any platform is going to have that spot, it's going to be you guys, I hope dude, great to meet you. I think this is a perfect place to kind of like wind down the convo. Thank you for coming on. This was honestly for someone who's a creative, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just a lowly creative. This is like enlightening. And I'm always trying to learn how data can tell a better story to like, you know, inform what I and my team should be doing. So thank you. Thank you for the insights. And um, maybe we'll have you on. Thanks again. for having me. Look, this was a blast of a conversation. Y'all are, I mean, you say you're a creative, but you're clearly like in the weeds on thinking really rigorously about this stuff. Like, you know, this was a, this was a really, really fun conversation, especially with other people who are practitioners who are in the weeds trying to figure out how do we help brands do better? So this was great. Thanks for having me on. Um, and you know, good luck to y'all as well. And Lucas, hopefully I will see you in a couple of hours here in Mexico city. For sure. For sure. No worries. All right, Mike, I'll see you later. Thanks so much for hopping on. Appreciate Thanks, it. Mike. All right. Talk Have to you later. One. See ya. Bye.